This week, I want to talk about the effects of insulin. Uh, insulin is involved in fuel switching, as you probably know. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at how it actually does that. Kind of the reason for this video, I've been promoting the idea of consuming more starch. I think uh, starch has gotten a bad rap over the last 20 years or so. I think starch actually has a lot of benefits. But the question that I get a lot is, what you're saying about starch is interesting. And I've been doing a keto diet. I'm thinking about reintroducing some carbs into my diet. What do you think about the idea of instead of just eating a steak, I'll have a potato with my steak? I get that question all the time. The short version is I don't think it's a good idea. If you're going to eat carbs, you might as well just go for it and have a big, very carb-rich meal. That's the thing that's going to get you going back, get your ability to burn carbs back. This is one of the studies that got me thinking again about carbs again as a major source of energy. If you follow the channel, you know that I think a lot about metabolic rate, the things that increase your metabolic rate, the things that slow it down. Uh, these are three men. So N equals three, but right. So this is a very high fat, pretty low carb diet with a decent amount of protein. And you can see the energy goes from 2000 calories down to 1600, down to maybe 1400 on the last day. And uh, in this checked area, they put these guys into a calorimeter. Um, this is basically like a one room apartment where the airflow in and out is controlled and they can measure very precisely how much oxygen you're consuming and how much carbon dioxide you're exhaling. And from that, they can figure out your metabolic rate and what kind of fuels you're burning pretty accurately. And so their metabolic rate on the first day uh, averaged around 2,400 calories. And then they go on this high carbohydrate overfeeding diet for uh, about seven days. You can see at the end, the last three days, they're consuming almost 5,000 calories of a very high carbohydrate diet. And this is their metabolic rate every day. Uh, so it goes from 2,400 calories on the last day of the high fat, low energy diet, all the way up to about 3,400 calories. Yeah, I'm looking at 2,400 up to 3,400. That's like, that's almost a thousand calorie increase due to the fact that they're just feasting on all these carbs for seven days. And so that kind of piqued my interest. And then here they go back to this uh, protein sparing modified fast diet. So this is, again, this is a very low calorie diet. Uh, you can see the calories go down to like six or 700. I think this is a ketogenic diet. 100% of the thousand calorie increase by massively eating carbohydrates was lost in two days of a protein sparing modified fast. Now, now they did gain fat during this period because they're, they're literally just stuffing their faces with almost 5,000 calories of carbs a day. But I think there might be a happy middle here. And I think this idea that consuming carbohydrates can increase our metabolic rate over time is quite convincing uh, if you look at a lot of the literature. So when we eat carbs, we do this thing called glucose-induced thermogenesis. This is in Young Healthy Controls. It's almost 9%. What that means essentially is if you eat a bunch of uh, a carbohydrate-rich meal, your metabolic rate will increase by about 9% if you're young and healthy. But if you're obese, that amount will only increase by maybe 6.5%. Older adults are down to less than 6%. For some reason, uh, young, healthy people, when they eat carbohydrates, they get a bigger surge in their metabolic rate than people who are obese or older people. The news gets worse. This is the result of people who lost weight doing calorie restriction. Their glucose-induced thermogenesis is down to about 3.5%. So I think the reason that obese people do less glucose-induced thermogenesis is to get the benefits of the glucose, you actually have to burn it. And so when they looked at younger controls uh, and they looked at and see here's what they're burning this is the white lines are carbohydrates the dark is dark lines are protein and i think this was sort of assumed that's why it's not changing and uh the lipid is this light gray and so if you look at the young healthy controls the one who are doing a lot of glucose induced thermogenesis this is 30 minutes before the meal this is three hours after the meal when the younger controls eat this meal the amount of fat that they're burning rapidly decreases in people, in the obese humans, and these are the ones with normal glucose tolerance, and these have impaired glucose tolerance, they can't shut off their lipid metabolism when they eat carbohydrates. And so my argument has been that the correct thing to do when you consume carbohydrates is to burn those carbohydrates first. But people who are obese are bad at doing that. They fail to turn off lipid metabolism in response to a starchy meal. And so the obese humans are stuck 
burning fat. They're not burning as much carbohydrate. And I believe that's why they don't see that carbohydrate induced thermogenesis. And so this study, this is one of my favorite studies, acute carbohydrate overfeeding. These people really went for it. This is respiratory quotient. That means that as you go up on this uh, axis, that means that you're burning more glucose and you're burning less fat. They consume about 336 grams of glucose on average, 1300 calories worth of near pure glucose. Uh, it was bagels at first, and then it was a glucose drink over two hours. Uh, the lean adults, you can see right away, you can see time zero is here. And at 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever this is, the lean adults, they're already burning more glucose. The respiratory quote jumps right off the starting line and it continues to increase. And even 120 minutes in, the lean are way ahead. If you go far enough along, you go to the three hour point, the, the overweight humans actually catch up to the lean humans and they're actually burning as much carbohydrate as they are. But that took 336 grams of nearly pure glucose. They, they overcame this kind of lag in in glucose burning. And why do they have this lag? What does insulin do? Insulin does a lot of things, but I'm going to focus on three big high level things that it does to actually help you to burn carbohydrates. So the first thing it does is it lowers free fatty acids because so free fatty acids are the fats circulating in your blood. And of course your cells can take in fat, they can take in glucose and they can take in protein. And those fuels are all essentially competing to be burned in the mitochondria. So if you have high circulating free fatty acids, you tend not to burn as much glucose. So you can see here's healthy young controls and their levels of free fatty acids at the beginning are lower than anyone's. And as they consume some glucose, these rapidly come down uh, and they have the lowest free fatty acids. The dark triangles are obese with impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, they start off quite high in these free fatty acids and the free fatty acids do come down, not nearly as steeply, and they never get nearly as low. Here's lipid oxidation. And so as free fatty acids start to drop, uh, fat oxidation stays high for about 30 minutes. But there's about a 30 minute lag. The free fatty acids drop for about an hour. Lipid oxidation drops mostly between the 30 minute and the 90 minute mark. Here's a study where they took young women and they looked at, do they have the ability to clear glucose? This is an oral glucose tolerance test. Group A, the women in group A were able to clear their glucose very quickly. They didn't even see a rise in glucose at the 30 minute mark after a glucose tolerance test. So these guys are just rapid uh, clears of glucose. Group B has a spike, but then by an hour, they're down below baseline. Group C takes the full two hours to get below baseline and group D never gets below baseline. This is the basis on which they separated these groups of people up. And then when they looked at free fatty acids, the ones that are the best burners of glucose have the lowest free fatty acids to begin with. And then they go even lower compared to everybody else. Uh, the ones who are reasonably good at clearing free fatty acids have the next lowest fasting free fatty acids. And so you see this inverse relationship between uh, free fatty acid levels and the ability to burn glucose. And just to show that the fats are indeed causal, um, in this experiment, they have this intralipid that they can inject into people's bloodstream. And this column here is actually glucose oxidation. And you can see this is sort of uh, the normal levels. And then if they inject this uh, fat solution to give them more free fats to burn, uh, you can see glucose oxidation goes down. And this is what that looks like at different doses of carbohydrates, right? Uh, you can see that this uh, dotted line is the insulin spike uh, when you consume the glucose. And so at 50 grams of carbohydrate, you get this mild insulin spike and free fatty acids drop for uh, maybe 120 minutes or so. You go up to 100 grams of carbs, the free fatty acids drop for maybe up to three to four hours. And if you go to 150 grams of carbohydrates, the free fatty acids are still low at 300 minutes. So that's five or six hours later. And of course, some of you are thinking, well, isn't that bad? We want to be able to burn fat. And well, you do. But remember, these people who ate 150 grams of carbs, this is just pure glucose tablets they consumed. If you look at the pre preceding charts where people ate 336 grams of glucose, their fat oxidation didn't go to zero. They're burning fat that whole time. And so, so if you just eat pure glucose, uh, you inevitably will continue to burn fat. If you consume way too much massive amounts of glucose, you might do de novo lipogenesis to replace the fat that you're burning. But the reality is you can't get fat metabolism to zero. It never goes to zero. 
There's an old saying in medical journals that I like to quote that says, fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate. Okay, what is the second thing that insulin does? It lowers circulating branched chain amino acids. It does this by preventing something called proteolysis or proteolysis. And proteolysis is literally the process by which your body breaks down its muscle tissues. And insulin prevents the breakdown of your muscle tissues. So that sounds pretty good, right? People are scared of insulin. They're like, I don't want, I, I don't want to eat starch. I don't want to spike insulin. Well, insulin helps you protect your muscle mass. This studies in Chinese adults. And what they did is they just, they split people up into uh, their fasting branched chain amino acids into three groups. So tertiary one is the one third of people with the lowest fasting branched chain amino acids. And tertiary three is the highest fasting BCAAs. And then they do the same thing. They give them this oral glucose tolerance test. And you can see that the glucose and the insulin are massively increased in adult humans who have high fasting branched chain amino acids. And this is that proteolysis. In this case, they took uh, non-obese and obese humans. And so we have two different tables here. This is glucose disposal rate. So this is the rate at which uh, yeah, people can burn glucose either oxidatively or storing it as glycogen. And this is endogenous leucine rate of appearance. So leucine is one of the branched chain amino acids. Your muscles are made of leucine as well as other amino acids. And what they're doing is they're measuring this coming out of the capillary beds in the muscle tissue. And so if you give insulin to a non-obese human, you have a large drop in the rate of of leucine, which is being broken down and released from your muscle tissues. Insulin stops you from breaking down your muscles. But if you're obese, insulin is much less effective at stopping you from breaking down your muscle tissues. And so when you're breaking down your muscle tissues, of course, you're releasing branched chain amino acids. Those branched chain amino acids are going into your bloodstream. That is making you insulin resistant. And just to show that this is true, this is another experiment. Um, in, in these people, they're they're given, you can see at time zero, uh, they're given glucose, and there's a control here. The, the white circles are ones who are given an amino acid infusion. And so they have amino acids going into their bloodstream, and glucose infusion rate drops when you give people amino acids. Fat, amino acids, and glucose are all competing for... Uh, the ability to get into the mitochondria and be burned. And so if you see a lot of amino acids coming in, the body thinks, oh, I'm, I'm like proteins coming in, so I should burn that. The idea that amino acids are competing with glucose isn't necessarily bad. Uh, that's just how the body switches fuel. But it's something to keep in mind if you want to become a better glucose burner. And so the last thing that insulin does is it activates pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is glucose coming in. This is the Krebs cycle uh, where we burn glucose and pyruvate dehydrogenase is the limiting step in allowing that glucose to burn. In humans, when they inject, so this is the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. And as they inject higher and higher levels of insulin, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase becomes activated. This is uh, glycogen synthase. So this helps you store glucose in your muscle tissues and in your liver. And this is your glucose metabolism. This is oxidative. So this is Glucose that actually gets burned as fuel in response to increasing insulin. Uh, this is glucose that gets stored, and this is total glucose uh, disappearance, as they call it. There's a really interesting kind of recent paper about this topic of what happens when we vary our macros within a meal to our branched chain amino acid response. This is an older paper. Uh, you can see 1958. Plasma amino acids after a high-protein meal um, they were given some kind of eggnog thing that was eggs and uh, dairy protein. Uh, and you can see the branched chain amino acids, especially valine and isoleucine, steadily increase for six hours after a high protein meal. And actually glycine, we like glycine, and glycine actually drops in response to a high protein meal. Increasing these branched chain amino acids after a meal will make you insulin resistant. Uh, and decreasing glycine may also probably make you insulin resistant. And in this case, if you eat a high protein meal, that's fine. That's expected, right? Um, you, you don't need to be insulin sensitive after a high protein meal. And again, this is one of the ways that the body controls fuel switching 
is with the circulating levels of these branched chain amino acids like valine and isoleucine. And I, I think this one is leucine, but the, the leucine peak is a little more dramatic and then it levels off as opposed to the valine and isoleucine, which has these long extended curves in this particular experiment. And so this is that study that I really like. Postprandial concentration of circulating branch chain amino acids are able to predict the carbohydrate content of the ingested mixed meal. There's three different meals here. Um, let's start with actually meal six. So this one has 30 grams of protein, uh, 26 grams of fat, and 52 grams of carbohydrate. So that's going to be the low carbohydrate meal. And then we move up to meal two, same amount of protein, same amount of fat, but now we have 95 grams of carbs. And then there's meal seven. So same amount of protein, same amount of fat, and now we're up to 180 grams of carbs. The actual things that they use to provide the protein, carbohydrate, and fat, I think were casein, dextrose, which is like a glucose uh, sugar that comes out of corn, and sunflower oil. So not the best meal, but uh, still <laughs> interesting. Uh, this middle one here is the carbohydrate. Um, and specifically, we're looking here at the curve for isoleucine. And so this is protein here. And what you can see is that that, that meal two, uh, which has 30 grams of protein and 95 grams of carbs and uh, 26 grams of fat, they're all being compared to that one. So this, this center, uh, the center curve and all of them is actually the same. It's that same meal. And then um, in this one, they added more or less protein. In this one, they added, well, less or more carbohydrates and the same with the fat. And so you can see what happens with the carbohydrate meal first. So this middle one, of course, is medium carbohydrates. And if they reduce low carbohydrates, so if they go down to the 52 grams of carbohydrates, the branched chain amino acid response to that meal increases significantly, despite the fact that they, they both have the same amount of protein and they both have the same amount of uh, branched chain amino acids in the meal. If they go to a high uh, carbohydrate meal, this is the 180 grams of carbohydrates, you have a massively blunted response to the branched chain amino acids in that meal. The insulin response from that high amount of carbohydrates is really putting the clamps on the level of branched chain amino acids. If you start with that same meal, that same test meal, but then you double the protein, I believe this is 60 grams of protein. Now you see this massively increased circulating branched chain amino acids after a meal. This meal is starting to look like, should I add a potato to my steak, right? I want to become a better glucose burner. Should I add a potato to my steak? Well, you're going to have this massive branched chain amino acid response to that meal because a potato is not a ton of carbohydrates. Uh, it's not going to give you anywhere near enough carbohydrates to suppress this branched chain amino acid. The steak is providing lots of protein and significant fat. And so adding a potato to that meal doesn't really do anything to help you burn carbohydrates. And this is just another look at this. Um, this is a different study. They varied all of these. Um, you can see the, the carbohydrate meal has 65% carbohydrates. Um, the protein meal is only 37%. The, this is something like the steak and potato meal. Uh, the high fat meal is down to 24% carbs and there's an alcohol or a meal served with alcohol. And you can see that out of the four diets, the carbohydrate meal ha is, is massively increased glucose oxidation. And of course, that's what you'd expect, right? If you eat carbohydrates, your body's going to burn carbohydrates. That's, that's logic, right? Well, you can see the protein meal has 60% as much carbohydrates as the carbohydrate rich meal. But at, at peak burn rate in the carbohydrate meal, you're burning something like two and a half times as much carbohydrate as you're burning in the protein meal. So even though the carbohydrate meal has way more carbs, you're still burning a disproportionately high amount of carbohydrates after the high carb meal, as opposed to after the high protein meal. That protein is going to prevent you from burning those carbs efficiently. So these are all the studies that we've looked at and I, I just put them on one page. And like I say, these come from three different studies. And you can see I actually lined up the zero time points here, right? This one is goes to negative 60, and this one starts at zero. So all the zeros are lined up. And then uh, this one goes for 300 minutes, and the 300 minutes are lined up, and this one goes for 480. So the 480s are lined up. And so if you just look up and down, uh, <laughs> what you'll see is that this period of maximum carbohydrate burning in the high carbohydrate meal, uh, you know, corresponds exactly with the suppression of the free fatty acids 
and it's this low curve on the branch chain amino acids. And so, so a high carb meal, you suppress BCAAs, you suppress uh, free fatty acids, and ta-da, carbohydrates burn. And so I've been talking a lot about, I've been eating these cassava flour pancakes for breakfast. It has helped me, it, it's reduced my fasting blood glucose by uh, 30 points, and I've been losing weight, and it's been great. And I just, you know, the reason that I did this, and I've talked a lot about this, um, but I just want to keep iterate, reiterating on these points. This is, if you just Google pancake recipe, this is the one that comes up, uh, good old-fashioned American pancakes, you know. Um, and the recipe is made of all-purpose flour, of course, uh, with milk, butter, and an egg. If I showed that recipe to a lot of people and said, where does the protein come from in this recipe? They're going to circle the milk and they're going to circle the egg, right? That's actually not true. Most of the protein in the, the majority of the protein in this recipe comes from the all-purpose flour. Grains are pretty high in protein. And so if I was to make this recipe and eat half of it, I'd get 620 calories, uh, 18 grams of protein, and about four grams of branched chain amino acids, and about 76 grams of carbs. This is the pancake recipe I've been making. So when I go to the cassava flour, uh, the protein from that flour goes from 10 grams down to two grams. Um, and so in my recipe, most of the protein does in fact come from the egg where you'd kind of expect, except I'm adding collagen because collagen is a great source of glycine and it's pretty low in branch chain amino acids. Sort of normal American pancakes have 18 grams of protein, mostly from wheat flour. Uh, this recipe has 17 grams of protein, which is mostly from collagen, which is very low in branched chain amino acids and very high in glycine. And so my recipe now has significantly more carbohydrates and it has significantly less branched chain amino acids than just normal pancakes, right? Even though they're both pancakes. But this recipe is going to allow me to burn carbohydrates efficiently, which is what I want to get better at doing, right? That's what I'm that's the thing I'm practicing is how do I how do I how do I make my metabolism look more like a lean person, which is to say, how do I make myself burn more carbs? And obviously, and, and what I, of course, do is I, I usually I cook these on, a, I have a nonstick uh, griddle at home that I can just cook the pancakes right on the griddle. I don't even add any fat to it. And then I add syrup to it. So really, I'm going to have 160 to 180 grams of carbs and only two grams of, of branched chain amino acids. And my thinking is that is the thing that's going to help me clear the, it's going to be enough of an insulin response to clear those free fatty acids to clear the branch chain amino acids, and I'm actually going to be able to burn that 180 grams of carbohydrate that I've eaten, and that carbohydrate is going to help me to burn more fat because fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates. And so just to sum up, obese humans are bad glucose burners. Uh, we're stuck burning fat. That's the difference between obese humans and lean humans, uh, metabolically speaking. Branch chain amino acids and free fatty acids compete directly with glucose. Uh, if you have high free fatty acids and you have high branch chain amino acids, you're not going to be an efficient glucose burner. The insulin is the signal that helps you clear those things. This is all pretty simple. Uh, I'm not saying anything. I don't even think I'm saying anything here that's controversial. Uh, I'm just, you know, I just want to clarify how this all works and what the evidence looks like. And so big carbs allow glucose to burn, right? <laughs> right. And, and this is we're gonna this is gonna come, of course, back to the the steak and potato question. The fact that I'm getting close to 200 grams of carbs at breakfast time and very low BCAA, uh, and I do this in the morning on purpose because I want to wake up and get my metabolic rate going for the day, right? I wake up, I have that big meal of pancakes. I say to myself, gotta fire the engines because I know that is what's gonna get things going. That's the same time I, I take my SEA, my steroid ethanolamide, uh, which I sell at fireinabottle.net slash shop. And I take my, um, my RALA, my alpha lipoic acid, and I take a B vitamin complex and a few other things. Look at my past videos and you can see uh, I take my poor tea extract to help prevent inflammation. And all of that is designed to, I wake up, get my metabolism going, right? Like, cause I, I really believe that the, the biggest difference between humans now and humans 100 years ago is that we've lost the step, metabolically speaking. I think what I would say to people who ask me the question of, should I add a potato to my steak? I would say no. If you, if you want to eat steak and if you want to become a better glucose burner, what I would say is eat pancakes for breakfast and steak for dinner. 
Uh, I would say wake up, eat that big starchy meal, you know, get yourself going. You can burn that throughout the day. And then, sure, if you want to have a steak for dinner, you know, go for it. But I don't think that combining a reasonably small amount of carbs like a potato with a big protein and fat steak is going to make you a better glucose burner. No, I don't believe that.